are at this moment in the middle of the rubble of the mighty city of Jerusalem. And this is where the great champion named Nehemiah did his thing. It caused him to go down in history as a mighty person. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 5, Nehemiah made this petition to the emperor. He said, Wouldest thou send me into Judah that I may build Jerusalem? What a change of jobs. <laughs> Living in the royal courts of Persia, speaking and talking to dignitaries every day, he assumed the personal relationship of saying, I'll be the leader. I'll be the trailblazer. I'll go out in front. He saw what you see right now. That was it. Some way or another, those odds and ends of stone had to become a wall. A wall of security, a wall of help, a wall of blessing. It had to work. He took on the responsibilities of this personal leadership. He did not request that he remain behind in the royal courts of Persia in order to keep serving the king. And one of the traits of championship is that he is a leader. He's not just an idea man. We got so many people that are idea men. Oh, I've got a great idea. What are you going to do with it? What's going to become of it? A true champion is a man or a woman who will sacrifice, who will sacrifice willingly. They will suffer for the cause in which they're so vitally interested in. Nehemiah was willing to leave the paved marble courts shining in their beauty, go across the heated sandy deserts, cross the mountains, possibly riding on the back of a camel or a mule, he had to carry his instruments for building the wall. There were none there. He had to bring with him supplies for food and for many other things. The sun was hot. The traveling was hard. And the going was slow. <laughs> but he didn't quit. He just didn't quit. Quitters never win. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. There's a secret there, you see. So many that looked as if they were God's champions, somewhere along the way, they conked out. They quit. And they didn't make it. Now, men can count you out, but it's God that counts you in. The people around Nehemiah would say, this rich guy here, he's never going to leave this place. No, he's going to stay here till he dies. But you see, inside of him was something that the natural man could not see. Inside of him was something so big <laughs> until it couldn't be measured. He was going to be God's champion. And God's champion personally leads into the unknown, into difficult situations, into hard work. Leaving Persia between the, uh, the great rivers, Euphrates, he could have gone north through the desert, come down through Damascus, pass by Mount Hermon, into Galilee, through Samaria to Jerusalem, or he could have come directly across the burning sands of the desert to Amman, the capital of Jordan, 
And from there he could have crossed the Jordan River, climbed up the Judean hills to Jerusalem, and have crossed the Mount of Olives. Just as he was arriving, he could have seen the wrecked and ruined city from the most remarkable place to see Jerusalem, and that is the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem, the immortal city, it refuses to die. You can fight it, and it rises up again. You can destroy it, and it's rebuilded. Because God has champions, champions of a cause, champions who will not quit, champions who are willing to labor and bring it into being. Now, Jerusalem is always exciting to see. <laughs> the first time you ever see Jerusalem, you never forget it. It places something upon your life that is not raceable. You just can't erase it. Whether you come down from the north, where the famous armies of history have marched against Jerusalem, toward the Damascus Gate, or whether you approach from the east and see it from the vantage place of the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem is always exciting. And Nehemiah and his royal caravan arrived. And no doubt, I can see him, like another great champion named Jesus of Nazareth, wept on Mount of Olives, looking into the golden city. Only he saw what you see here now. This is, this is what he saw. He saw rugged rocks. He saw tattered bits. He saw complete disarray. They entered Jerusalem. What would a man do when he sees a mess like this? I want to give you the secret of championship. It's in Nehemiah 2.13. He says, I went out by night by the gate of the valley down below us here, a few hundred yards. Even before the dragon, the dragon well and to the dung port where they had thrown their garbage which we can see also here. And there I viewed the walls of Jerusalem, broken down, as you see them here. The gates thereof were consumed with fire. He saw and experienced a full observation. He saw how big the task was. Listen to what he says in verse 14. He says, I went to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. There was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Just like a donkey from going from here, <laughs> up there would have a very difficult time, you know, right now. Then when I up to the, in the night by the brook, night by the brook, I viewed the wall and I turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so I returned. Verse 16 says, And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. They didn't know. One of the secrets of greatness is keeping your mouth shut. People who brag never do much for God. Bragging and greatness don't go together very often. The rulers didn't know where I went nor what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, or to the common people, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. He didn't go there bragging on what he was going to do. If you're going to brag about what you're going to do, you may get into real difficulty, real sorrow, maybe real defeat, you know. It's better to do it than to talk about it. Some men say, I'm going to build this and that and the other. And then when it's not built, they have to hang their heads and say, well, it didn't work out. Champions don't do it that way. They do it another way. Je Nehemiah saw the plight of Jerusalem firsthand. It was no longer a rumor. It was no longer a story that was told. 
his kinfolks didn't have to say the wall was down. He saw the wall down, you know. Great champions keep themselves informed. They don't say so-and-so told me. They said, I saw, you know. A man that runs a factory well is all over the factory about, about every hour. You don't know when he's coming or where he's going, but he's in charge, you see. That was the greatness of this man. After he'd seen it all for three, for three days and three nights, you know, he could have seen it all within an hour if he'd have wanted to. But greatness means to stick it on the inside of you, to suck it in, you know, and to get deep down inside of you, this thing. In verse 17, he makes the new step. He says, he called all the people together and he said, you see the distress that we're in? That's a dynamic approach to anything, you know. Just to tell the people, you see the mess we're in, you know. Nothing is hidden, you see it. You see how Jerusalem lies waste? You see the gates are burned with fire? Come. That's the challenge. Come. Let us build up the wall. Let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. I wish the church would say that today. The church bears reproach in our land because it doesn't have champions. If it had champions, it wouldn't have to bear reproach. The champions would win, you see. God needs mighty men and mighty women who would champion the cause of right and goodness and holiness and love. And without those champions, you simply cannot be a winner. People need leaders. No people can be great without leaders. There's no thing in history of greatness without leadership. God needs leadership in order to do anything on the face of this earth. And the church needs leadership. What did he do? He saw it firsthand. There's nothing so great as to knowing firsthand the need. And then he challenged. He rose up like a mighty giant. Says, now, you see it, you see it, there it is. Let's do something about it. <laughs> oh, that's greatness. That we be no more a reproach. If God could give us a few real champions right now in our land, that there be no more reproach. The people began to look at one another and say, what should we do? What should we do? And then the champion begins to explain the hand of God upon him. He reports to the people. He testifies of what God has done for him. He didn't ask the people's opinion about this. He didn't say, do you think it's all right that I've come over here to do this? He didn't discuss if this first plan don't work what we're going to do with a second plan. There was no possibility of failure. He did not form a committee to consider the problem. He just said, it's time now for us to be winners. Look what he said in verse 18. He says, I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. You see, that's what we like. We like, we like success. Who, who likes failure? You know, that's one thing that maybe missionaries have missed in the past. They came home to tell their failures. I had a hard time here and I was sick over there and I got nobody saved over there. People are not too interested in failures. When the <laughs> Apostle Paul came back to Jerusalem, he said, I'd like to tell you how whole nations have become uh, servants of the Most High God and how through mighty signs and miracles from here to Europe I have seen. Hey, that's great, you know, that's, that's a witness and a testimony. Champions give great witness. Champions give great testimony of the power of the Most High God. 
Verse 18 says, I told them of the hand of God, which was good upon me. Also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And when he gave his report and his testimony, the Bible says, the people said, let us, let us rise up and build. <laughs> the common people will respond where there's leadership. Don't be beating people over the head and say, you do this, you do that. No, get out and start doing it. You know, we had such a Sunday school and a church of mine one time that the mayor of the city came out several times just to see it. He said, I've never seen anything like this before. Hundreds of little children worshiping God and studying the word of God. They didn't get there accidentally. They got there by leadership. You've got to have leadership. And leaders are those that lead the way. Nehemiah three and one. Listen, then Elashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate and sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even to the tower of Mesh. They sanctified it under the tower of Haniel. <laughs> you see, the champion got a hold of the leaders, you know, men of ability. They jumped up and said, say, this is great. That's what champions are all about inspiring people. So the leader said, we'll do it. After him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Ab Asbuk, the ruler of, of a half part of Bethzor, under the place over against the sepulchres of David, to the pool that was made, and of the house of the mighty. They began to build. The people began to rise up. And they began to build. And, and the walls went up. Now nobody did anything until the champion arrived. You gotta know that. It, 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 things don't accidentally get started. They get started by compassion, by vision, by action. That's the way they get going. And then they inspire the leadership to follow them. And then all the people follow after them. They begin to build the wall. But every time you start building something material, Spiritual needs appear. And that's what we want to show you here. It's in Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 1. The champion immediately discovered the burdens of the poor. There was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews, their own people. For there were, they said, we, our son, we and our sons and our daughters are many Therefore, we take up the corn for them that we might, may eat and live. They were hard workers. Some also said that they were, we have mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also those that said, we borrowed money for the king's tribute to pay taxes and upon our heads, upon our lands and our vineyards. Now, our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren our children as their children, and though we bring into bondage our sons and daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already, neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. So in building for God, the problems arise. But that's what champions are for. And that same chapter, verse 6, it says, I was very angry when I heard the cry and these words, I consulted with myself. I rebuked the nobles, I rebuked the rulers, said unto them, ye exact usury from your brother? And I set a, a great assembly against them. I said unto them, we after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen, and will ye yet sell your own brethren, or shall they be sold unto you? Then held they their peace, and found nothing to answer. You don't answer back a champion, buddy. When he's in charge and he sees things that are dishonest and cruel, he moves in. The only thing you can do is obey. So I said, it is not good what you do. Are you not to walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of the heathen who are our enemies? Likewise, my brethren and my servants, you might exact of them money and corn, I pray you. Let us leave off this usury, you know, high usury high interest. Restore 
to them this day their lands and their vineyards and their olive yards and their houses. Also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn and the wine and the oil that ye have exacted of them. Then said they, <laughs> leadership is so great. We will restore. We will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. It only takes a champion to turn the world around. It only takes a champion not only to build walls, but make people worthy to live within the walls. As soon as they were building the walls, up came the problems. And champions can do more than build walls. They can build a society. They know what's wrong and what's right. Many of the judges in our land today do not know what's right and wrong. They make wrong judgment in courts. They don't know what sin is. They don't know that it's a reproach to any people because they're not God's champions. God's champions know when the poor are hurt and when the poor need help and they rise up to help them. Then I, Nehemiah says, I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to, to this promise that they were going to supervise this. Also, I shook my lap and said, shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Even thus it should be shaken out and emptied. Boy, all the congregation said, amen. And it says, they said, praise the Lord. That's in the Bible. It's in verse 13. And the people did according to this promise. This great champion, Nehemiah, like the Lord Jesus, he heard the, the cry of the poor. He championed their cause. And he not only personally led the way to build the walls, but he personally led the way to peace and to happiness. Great champions change societies. Great champions lift up the hurt and lift up the sorrowing and lift up those that need something from God. I don't believe it's possible for me to say with a sufficient energy, our nation today needs champions. We need men and women first that will come down because champions are those of usually of great abilities to come down and then to raise up the people, to raise them up. God needs you. Please, God needs you. Our times in which we live need you. We live in very particular times. This might be the ultimate generation on the face of this earth. And God needs champions. And he needs someone to challenge the common people to rise up and be a champion for the Most High God. Would you today make a very deep consecration and say like Nehemiah of old, I'm willing to give up high position. I'm willing to give up luxury. I'm willing to sacrifice anything. To be a champion for God. To find the need. To find the sorrow. And heal the sorrow. And meet the need. Would you be a champion for the Most High God? I will bless you. Bless my neighbor and my friend right now. Let them be blessed. Let them rise up from the ranks to be a man and a woman of God. Let them now fulfill divine destiny for their lives. In this world of mediocrity, give us champions, courageous, strong, loving, tender, that will change our world. This is a most dramatic hour. Bless and strengthen and help. And I believe for it in Jesus' name.